A single responsibility principle is often quoted as the most important of all solid principles when it comes to mastering software complexity. Yet, it also seems to be the hardest one to apply properly. Here is a practical guide that explains, step by step, where, when and how to apply the single responsibility principle. Here is a prototype I wrote a few days ago. Its purpose is to export scalable vector graphics from DRAWI or documents and add hyperlinks to create interactive diagrams. I think the code is not a complete mess. It got some smaller functions to encapsulate details, but it also has some issues, which are quite common when violating the single responsibility principle. Let's assume two developers are working in this project. One is working with the domain expert and is implementing all the application logic like analyzing the diagrams and deciding about proper references. The other one is working with the UX expert, realizing all requests for best user experience. As both aspects are completely mixed in this code base, the developers will face merge conflicts frequently. Before launching this code to production, we definitely want to add some tests to ensure that the code is working as expected. While this code could certainly be tested as is, these tests would probably be unnecessarily complex and less focused as the application logic is coupled with technical details. Furthermore, with the current design the application logic cannot be reused in other contexts easily, for example a web application, as details like file I.O. are embedded into the application logic. The root cause of these, and even more issues, is the violation of the single responsibility principle. So what exactly does the single responsibility principle state? The name single responsibility principle seems to imply that a module should do only one thing. While this certainly applies to functions and methods, this is not exactly true for classes and modules. The most common definition of the single responsibility principle for classes and modules is a class should have only one reason to change. Sounds meaningful and correct, but what exactly are reasons to change? When thinking more closely about it, it turns out that software systems are changed to satisfy their stakeholders. These stakeholders effectively are the reasons to change. Different stakeholders have different roles, resulting in different perspectives on the software system, leading to different requests for change. The domain expert requests changes of the application logic. The UX expert requests changes to the look and feel of the application. The operator requests changes to support flexible deployments. And the architect requests changes to keep the technology stack up to date. In summary, the single responsibility principle states, a module should be responsible to exactly one stakeholder or one role. Now there are roles and their reasons to request change, which are quite obvious, so we want to separate those almost always right away. Let's start with application logic and input-output operations. Examples of violating the separation of these reasons for change are reading and writing files directly in the application logic, database stored procedures containing business logic, and calling external services directly from the application logic using for example HTTP. This code is guilty of mixing file operations directly with the application logic as shown earlier. So let's separate these reasons for change. Therefore I'm going to create a class called pagereader and I'm going to pass the input file to the constructor. Then I'm going to create a method called readPages, which is independent from any I.O. This method will then be responsible to read the file, pass the XML and return all the page names. I'm also applying my favorite naming conventions to the generated member. OK. Now let's move on to the second violation of I.O. operations within the application logic. In order to extract the process start call from the application logic, I'm going to create another class called SVG Exporter. I'm again passing the input file to the constructor together with an output folder. Let's generate the class and move it to a separate file. Now I'm going to move the process start call into the SVG Exporter. Therefore, I'm going to create an export method which returns an SVG document. Let's fix the argument name and paste the process start call. We can now also encapsulate the path to the draw IO executable inside the SVG exporter. I'm again applying my favorite naming conventions to the members.
and I'm then introducing the SVG document required by the caller. The SVG document will be a record type containing the name and the content of an SVG document. Let's add the missing usings and create an instance of the SVG document. This shows that the export method requires another parameter, which is the page name. So let's add it. Now I can complete the creation of the SVG document. Finally, I'm fixing the generation of the SVG file name. And of course, I also have to adapt the caller to the changed signature of the export method. Now that the remaining file I.O. operations are also encapsulated in the SVG exporter, I can clean up the application logic by using the SVG document. So I'm passing it as an argument to add links and I'm going to adapt all the usages of the previous parameters. Finally, I'm adding one more API to the SVG exporter to save an SVG document back to the file system. To keep the implementation of the save method simple, I just take over the code previously used in the application logic. Ok, this code already looks cleaner, but this file still combines two responsibilities I like to separate in this step as well. On the one hand it contains the actual application logic and on the other hand it acts as the main component which composes the different classes and modules of the application. To separate these responsibilities I'm going to create a new class called SVG Processor. Let's generate this class and move it to a separate file. Let's also generate the method add links to this new class. And now I'm taking all the application logic and I'm moving it over into the SVG Processor. Let's fix the missing usings and also the missing access modifiers. To finish the implementation of the SVG processor, I'm going to pass the pages collection to the constructor of this class. Let's introduce a member for the available page names so that we can access those from the implementation of the class. Oops, I forgot to add the proper access modifier. And with this, the application logic is separated from the composition code as well. Now testing becomes that simple that there is hardly any excuse to not do it. So let's add at least one basic test. Therefore I am going to create a test case to check that links should be added for existing pages. As input for our testing we also need an SVG document. Including a huge SVG string in the test directly might not look beautiful, but fetching test relevant data from other sources like an external file is something I like even less as it makes the test harder to understand. I first create an instance of the SVG processor and I pass a collection of available page names which are system and parser. Then I'm going to call the API I want to test which is add links and I need to pass an instance of the SVG document record. So let's create one with the content provided above. In order to verify that the add links method is working as expected, I first need to extract the parser element from the SVG document. Then I'm going to verify that this element has a handler for the onclick event registered. Of course I also need to add the test attribute and Visual Studio Code is showing me that I can simplify this code here as well. Now let's execute the test. Oh, looks like the f -sharp test controller has some issue here. Let's ignore this for now. But this test is also failing with the proper test adapter. What's wrong? I simply need to make sure that I'm fetching the most inner div element for this verification. Let's rerun the test. And it is green. Awesome. The requests to change the code for parsing inputs or formatting outputs typically come from different roles than those responsible for the application logic, so we want to separate these responsibilities accordingly. Examples of violating the separation of these reasons for change are parsing strings into structured data like datetime inside the application logic 
or formatting data structures as for example HTML inside the application logic. The concrete violations in this codebase are parsing the display text of an SVG element and formatting SVG elements with specific CSS attributes. I start extracting these responsibilities by creating another class called SVG Caption Parser and I'm going to create a member for this class right in the SVG processor. I'm then taking the existing getDisplayText method and I'm moving it over to the SVG Caption Parser. And I'm moving this class to a separate file as well. In order to address the second violation, I'm going to introduce another class, which is called the SVG Hyperlink Formatter. And I'm also going to create a member for this class in the SVG processor. I'm then extracting all the formatting code from the SVG processor and I'm moving it into the SVG Hyperlink Formatter into an API called Apply Style. And I'm going to move this class into a separate file as well. The last step of this refactoring is of course passing instances of the new classes to the constructor of the SVG processor. Okay, the responsibilities are organized way better now. However, there are two additional opposing perspectives that we always strive to keep separate within our code base. Functional versus non-functional requirements. Examples of violating the separation of these reasons for change are adding caching directly to the repository pattern implementation or the class performing expensive computations, spreading usage logging over all web controllers, or having authentication and authorization scattered across the entire code base. This application does not have such violations yet, but if I would have to introduce some caching for performance, I would definitely use the decorator pattern to separate the caching logic from the data acquisition logic as explained in this video. Now here's the catch. Looking at a particular module or class, the different roles and corresponding responsibilities are not always obvious. If responsibilities are not changing independently, separating those would cause unnecessary complexity. Let's look at the heart of this application, the SVG processor. It still does multiple things. It finds page references, it adds the on-click event handler and it applies the formatting. Are these responsibilities we should separate? Which different roles would request different changes at different times? In such cases I recommend the following strategy. Keep it simple. Keep use case related code together. If you assume a module will be reused in different contexts and you are not very clear about the different roles yet, I suggest to keep your initial design of this module and apply the interface segregation principle as explained in this video. And then relax. Wait for the requests for change to occur and then apply the necessary refactoring. Looking at the new design of this application again, we can see that different reasons for change are well separated. But we also have to realize this application is still hard to change as the new classes are tightly coupled. And the design principle that helps fixing this problem, I explain in this video.